All right. I want to welcome everybody. I think that we will probably have some participants coming up on the screen. Um, my name is John Williams, and I am with the Slave Dwelling Project. I am a principal at the Booker T. Washington Learning Center in Reedsville, North Carolina. I've been with the Slave Dwelling Project since 2014, and have done six different educational visits with Joe, and uh, also have had them at my school with, with students, and um, now I serve on the board of directors. So I'm very excited about today, very excited for Dr. Stevens and her team from the University of Alabama. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Stevens, and we can go ahead and get started. I'm actually going to have August start with the presentation. All right. Thank you. Might be on mute. Yes, yeah, sir. Hi. Good morning, everybody. And um, welcome to our panel, Not Just the Plantation, Changing Narratives at Historic Sites, Museums, and University Campuses. I'm the moderator, Mr. August Dawson Darbone. I'm a historian of Louisiana history and a former site interpreter for the Slavery at Oak Alley exhibit at the Oak Alley Plantation Historic Site. I'm joined by a wonderful team here, uh, three wonderful people on this panel. I have Dr. Rachel Stevens, who is an associate professor of art history at the University of Alabama and focuses on the visual and material culture of enslavement. I have Mr. Travian, uh, Travian Ambrose, who is an undergraduate history major at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. He's worked as an intern at the National Trust for Historic Preservation site, The Shadows of on the Tesh in New Iberia, Louisiana, to tell a further and more inclusive history, going on to create a digital mapping project that centers on the lives and experiences of the enslaved community and their descendants, which is entitled Beyond the Shadows. And then joining us soon will be Ms. Bridget Janae Jones. She's the Director of Equitable Partnerships for Bellmead Historic Site and Winery in Nashville, Tennessee, and is also the founder of Bridge Builders Historical Consulting, LLC. Her academic focus is the lasting legacy of American chattel slaver enslavement in Tennessee, on Tennesseans. So thank you all for joining us. Welcome to our panel where we will discuss the legacy and remembrance of shadow slavery at various sites and settings throughout the South. And so without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Stevens and she will tell you about enslavement at the University of Alabama. Thank you, August. And thank you all for uh, joining us this morning. I'm delighted to be here and to share this screen with my distinguished co-presenters. Um, let's see. I'm going to share my screen here. Can you see the president's mansion on the screen? I can't see it. There. Um, we can't see it just yet. It's a it's a black screen right now. I'll try it again. Okay, I think that it is coming up. There we go. All, All right. right, great. So I'm coming to you today from Richmond, Virginia, where I'm a fellow at the Virginia Humanities at the Library of Virginia. Um, my normal um, place of residence is Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where I'm an associate professor, as August said, of art history. And I want to take just a few minutes today to talk about um, not only on our campus, but also how it is being um, remembered today, finally. Um, so I'll give you a brief history in case it's not a subject that you're familiar with. It's a subject that actually, unfortunately, is not well publicized, um, but is becoming more so, and um, kind of discuss what the university is doing and the measures they're taking to memorialize the enslaved people here. And maybe even um, Slave Dwelling Project would, after learning about the quarters we have, 
uh, visit the campus at some point. Um, uh, uh, that'd be awesome. So anyway, although many universities across the US have been grappling with the ways that their institutions are implicated in the history of slavery, the University of Alabama has been a little bit embarrassingly slow to come to this point. Um, in fact, as I said, the history of slavery on our campus is still little known and little discussed, but this is finally starting to change here in 2021. Um, like probably everyone in this room, it's, I believe, imperative to uncover the history of all the people um, on our campus, um, including the dozens of enslaved people who lived and labored there. So I'll discuss some of their history and um, I'll jump right in by um, showing you a few images, uh, a few of the images that um, that we have related to the history of enslavement. Starting with this work, this is the uh, just a little excerpt of the Basil Manley Diary. Manley was the second and longest serving president of the university and also an enslaver who not only purchased enslaved people on behalf of the university, but um, enslaved 42 people um, on his own at the president's mansion on campus. So it's often very easy for people to fall down an idea that the story history is hard to tell. Um, I heard some about this yesterday in, in the talks, but we actually have many, many records at the University of Alabama, despite all odds, despite the fact that the university was burned during the Civil War, um, lots of things have been lost or destroyed. There's actually a whole history of enslavement there in the archives waiting to be told, waiting to be parsed and dissected. And so this is just a little excerpt from Manley's diary. There are six diaries that he basically recorded almost um, all of his observations seemingly through a history of his presidency, including lots and lots of information about the engagements of the enslaved people on campus. And so this is a huge source of information. Of course, the words come from an enslaver. So we always remember that there's some reading between the lines required that the information is filtered through the perspective of the enslaver in this case. Um, but but the stories are there and they can be they can be drawn out. A little bit about the history of enslavement. Here's an early image of the campus in the central quad, which is still the central quad today. That rotunda building in the center was burned in the Civil War, and that's where Gorgas Library stands today. And in the foreground of this image is where Denny Chimes would be um, if you were standing on campus today, if you're familiar. But through an evolving system of enslavement that involved university and private ownership of enslaved people, as well as the rental or hiring out of their services from other local, pe um, local people, um, UA was a very racially diverse place during the antebellum period. Now, the students and professors were all white and all male but we need to see the full picture here. And what we actually see occurring is a simultaneous trust and disrespect of those individuals. It kind of speaks to the complicated nature of the structure of enslavement on that campus and in general, but enslaved people were a very significant part of the organiza organizational cog of the university, involved in its construction, its daily upkeep, its very fabric. Um, the faculty, the students, the president, and the enslaved people were all in daily, even constant interaction on the campus. This is a president, a, a portrait of Basil Manley, the president I mentioned. Um, he had a very heavy hand in the growth of the use of enslaved labor on the campus. And um, these people were the human engines that drove the university. In 1840, he admitted as much. In a, board, in a report to the Board of Trustees, um, he said, quote, in short, we could not do business a single day without slaves. These are a few of the antebellum buildings that remain on campus from um, before the Civil War. Many of the main structures, as I mentioned, were burned. Um, but just to give you a sense that enslaved people were in and out of every building across campus, um, responsible for their care, upkeep, cleaning, often construction, and they were assigned a wide range of tasks. Um, those that the university actually owned, which varied in number over over the years from between two to about maybe 12, um, had set duties such as attending to, to the dormitories and classroom buildings, 
but they were really given a whole wide variety of tasks. Um, as Manley put it, when he described the work of two enslaved men rented by the college named Peter and William, as to their employment, it is difficult to state it. Besides their daily work about the colleges, they have some two or three hours a day for other work, which have been spent in whatever seemed most to benefit the university. Basically, he's going to employ these people in whatever way will best utilize them, their skills, and benefit the university, as he says. Um, he also described William's ready use of tools, his excellence as a carpenter, his um, abilities as a good house servant. So these are just some of the things he said about two of the enslaved people on campus, but his diaries are actually full of the stories of dozens of these people. Um, Here's an 1854 copy of the bylaws of the University of Alabama, which show that the services of the enslaved people were written into the trustees' bylaws, um, performing a range of services, which really knew no bounds. So Manley would send enslaved individuals to track down students who were missing from town, for example, from the dorms and had gone to town, for example, or who were hiding from punishments. Um, skilled enslaved people were used for landscaping and construction jobs, including planting trees and laying bricks and painting walls and putting thousands and thousands of shingles on roofs. And then if none of the university owned slaves had particular skills that were needed, then skilled enslaved craftsmen would be rented um, from enslavers in town and around the vicinity of the university. One key building that still exists today, of course, is the president's mansion. And based on the regular reporting of the progress on his house and his diaries, Manley was very involved in the construction of this. And he also described the extensive work in constructing it that was done by the enslaved people on campus. There are still um, slave quarters present today on campus behind the president's mansion. There are four of those. I'll skip forward to show them to you. Here is one of them, how it looks today. These are mostly used as storage today. One of them's used as a garage. Um, but uh, perhaps surprisingly, there are these four, four slave quarters on campus that um, most people don't know are there. These are original one-story brick buildings. These serve to house Manley's enslaved people. Um, so he had these constructed at the time of, of the house in 1842. Um, what, two were quarters, actually. One served as the kitchen, and another was a well and wash house. There's a Habs photograph of just a glimpse of them from 1933. This is the back of the mansion, and there was also the Habs plans that were drawn. You can see them here. And here's the second one. That one has the storeroom and the well and creamery. Um, this was a corridor now used as a garage, and here is the, the final one. And here's another view of, of the other storage storage quarter that's, that's still um, extant today. So just to wrap up and pass the baton, I think it's really um, critical that we understand the antebellum campus of the University of Alabama, um, much, much wider than the view that is typically given of the history of students or presidents or trustees or graduates. So the picture that emerges here is one of incredible labor demanded of enslaved people, enormous benefit to the university that needs to be acknowledged, and all of this within the context of being unfree. Um, despite this, they were able to form families, many of them. They practiced Christianity. They had um, their own local congregations and um, worked as the most skillful people on campus. When the campus burned only eight days before the end of the Civil War, many of them escaped and evacuated um, the town. So, so there have been some actions that have been taken um, in the last years. In 2004, the faculty of the University of Alabama apologized for the university's history of enslavement. At that time, they put, put up this grave marker um, which marked the graves of an enslaved boy named William Boise Brown, an enslaved man named Jack Rudolph. And then if you fast forward to 2019, the Faculty Senate passed a resolution to research and share the history of the university's past implication with slavery. A task force has been formed, of which I'm a part, 
that has been convening weekly under the guidance of Dr. Christine Taylor, the university's chief diversity officer. And then with funding from the president and provost, um, finally, we have hired three graduate students. We have a call for a postdoctoral um, fellow for next year that is about to be published. So if there's anybody interested in doing this work on a full-time basis as a postdoc, um, we're searching for that. As, uh, and these people work alongside a faculty research committee who are forming a commission. So the ball is in motion um, and we're trying to, to put together this story in order to finally submit a report about this really rich and important history. With that, I will stop sharing my screen. All right, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Stevens. And who would uh, who's who's up next? Trey is next. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Stevens, for that. Yes, uh, Travian Ambrose is going to be next, telling us about his work in the New Iberia, Louisiana community, retracing the steps of the enslaved and how their history still impacts those communities today. So welcome, Travian, and I'm excited to hear about your research. No problem, and thank you once again. Uh, good morning, everyone. So what I'm going to first do is share my screen, actually. And I'm going to hop over uh, to this page uh, right here. Uh, once again, I am Travian Ambrose. I am an undergraduate uh, senior history major at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Uh, and this summer... I actually had the opportunity to work as an intern uh, with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, uh, working with the Trust Stewart site known as the Shadows on the Tesh. And so just a quick history of the Shadows on the Tesh, just a brief overview. Uh, the Shadows on the Tesh is an urban plantation complex uh, for slave reform that was developed on the outskirts of what is now the town or city of New Iberia. Uh, the early origins of the site itself dates back to 1834, uh, where the enslaver family known as the Weeks uh, built a home where the enslaved uh, Africans and African Americans uh, lived and labored in conjunction with uh, the other forest plantation complex the enslaving family owned uh, at Weeks Island. Uh, in regards to the overall structure of the site, essentially it was a way of which to both support uh, the work that was happening at the sugarcane complex at Grand Cote or Weeks Island uh, through the production of food stuff items, essentially yams, corn, uh, soy, etc., uh, to provide food, essentially. And so through this project that I was able to work on uh, alongside the team at The Shadows to help tell that fuller story. And so one of those lenses that I focused primarily on was through a digital mapping project that became a digital mapping collection uh, that took on many other lives as well. Uh, but essentially to tell that fuller story, uh, to think through the lens of enslavement, but also the lenses of emancipation. And so I'm actually going to click uh, this link right here to Beyond the Shadows. And so Beyond the Shadows, once again, as I said, is a digital mapping project, a digital mapping collection as well, uh, that really took on many lives. Uh, but it's essential resort to explore the peoples, places, and histories that have shaped the shadows on the Tesh. And so the first part, essentially, uh, is this collage of images, uh, of faces, essentially, thinking through, once again, uh, those histories of chattel enslavement, but also the histories of emancipation, uh, as all of these individuals were these people uh, that intertwined within uh, the site known as the Shadows. And so just skimming through it, and I hope everyone does take the time out to uh, look at this link, uh, but essentially it is a digital resource, once again, but in a sense to place yourself as a potential visitor to the shadows, uh, this link will be provided for you, uh, essentially to provide additional information before, during, or after visiting the shadows on the Tash, uh, to really think about the history uh, and the context of which the site is producing those conversations. And so as we begin uh, looking at Beyond the Shadows, we're first going to draw attention to migration. 
Migration, of course, thinks about, once again, the place that is uh, New Iberia, the place that is the Bayou Tash, uh, connecting the indigenous histories, uh, the first histories at the site, uh, especially the, pointing to the 1970s archeological excavation, uh, which points to pottery shorts, uh, which indicate uh, a settlement or an establishment uh, in the early Mississippian period cultures uh, by the Plaquemine people. Uh, the next section points, of course, uh, to the understanding of slavery and Louisiana, uh, the introduction of what is chattel enslavement, but also the context of Louisiana being its arrival in 1719 uh, with the forced uh, enslavement of West Africans into French Louisiana. From that point, we're introduced to the idea of movable property, which discusses specifically uh, that period of the antebellum period in which the U.S. domestic slave trade uh, begins to ramp up after uh, the antebellum, after uh, the end of the transatlantic slave trade or the U.S. involvement in transatlantic slave trade uh, in 1808 by the U.S. Congress prohibition of it. Uh, but once again, thinking through those lens of mass industrialization of the of that system. From that lens, we're introduced once again through uh, to the shadows. And from this lens, the shadows combines the earlier histories that connect to the site, uh, the site at Bayou Serra, which is in West Feliciana Parish, uh, the site at Grand Cote, Weeks Island, a sugarcane complex, uh, but linking once again, uh, the histories of chattel enslavement, of generational wealth uh, built through generational trauma. And so through those lenses of it being an urban showpiece, uh, of course, from this map, you can see that it outlines, once again, uh, the wider histories or the wider uh, land holding, uh, placing, once again, that idea, that sense of place and understanding. And so just hovering over here, we have the original 1825 land, land holding, but also the white box, which marks uh, the current uh, property line, and the red box, which marks the center street uh, quarters, uh, where wooden uh, cabins once stood uh, for, for the enslaved community. From this lens, kind of skimming very quickly, uh, we're introduced to the enslaved community through the lens of thinking about community and culture. Uh, from those lens, it's from religious perspectives. It's also from the perspectives of thinking about them outside of the work uh, that they did. Once again, thinking about them in regards to their stories, their experiences, their realities, their identities, uh, which were at the shadows, but also at the, at the other plantation complex known as a Weeks Island. From that lens, we're also introduced to the enslaving family, uh, thinking once again about the earliest purchase of the enslaved people, uh, the earliest purchase being an enslaved woman named Catherine uh, in Natchez, Mississippi. Uh, but also introducing once again that lens about connecting the wider histories with those understandings. Um, from moving on, uh, we're introduced through to the legacy of slavery, which I really want to discuss with everyone here today. Uh, the legacy of slavery, uh, thinking once again, 13th Amendment passage in 1865, uh, the, pack, the practice of chattel slavery of uh, being abolished in the United States, but once again, the decades after 1865, uh, display the different meanings of emancipation as centuries old systems continued. A uh, freedom for African-Americans living in emancipation meant living under racial segregation and violence as second class citizens with rights and opportunities varying between states and localities. It is through this understanding, this very significant lens, we're introduced to the Iberia Emancipation Trail. So the Iberia Emancipation Trail, which is a part of Beyond the Shadows, is essentially a way to think through emancipation, not as a single act uh, of the 13th Amendment or an act of a proclamation, more as an act, more as a decades or a generations, if you will, uh, of experiences of being born into emancipation. As an era, uh, the term connects and spans the different lives and experiences of the freed people and their descendants through the extensive histories of Reconstruction, a Reconstruction's aftermath of the 20th century and into today's time and world. In this understanding, emancipation is not a singular uh, experience and covers Black life and history circa 1865. And so it is from this lens, uh, we're very much so introduced to that idea of how did emancipation unfold specifically 
beyond uh, the formal gates of the plantation complex of the shadows and into the community of New Iberia, the community of Iberia Parish. While this may be very regionally specific, it once again demonstrates that wider history, the wider stories of emancipation and experiences of African-Americans after uh, formal enslavement ends and the period of general emancipation begins. And so this lens provides us a very interesting map to really think through. This map is composed large in parts in working with nonprofit community partners at the Iberia African American Historical Society, relying on community stories uh, that were written many years ago, of course, using primary source documentation, newspaper articles, uh, collections, et cetera. Uh, definitely peering and looking at the different histories of emancipation being lived out uh, in Iberia Parish and New Iberia specifically. And so, of course, it contains narratives and stories. I will not click them because they are very detailed uh, in nature, uh, but including narratives and stories that, once again, do not speak about a narrative of progress, rather a narrative of these lived experiences, living under these different systems, finding a place of their own, and creating those different communities of which now stand today. And so we, of course, have narratives and stories. Um, additionally, landmarks and places and communities. Uh, narratives and stories highlight very specific narratives and stories uh, that help provide a little more or additional context, if you will. Uh, focusing on landmarks and places, once again, thinking about the establishment of black churches, of black institutions, of black federal credit unions and tourist homes uh, in response to the built environment of exclusion and the addition of communities, which once again, speaking about that paradox of thinking about what happened or what uh, did African-Americans uh, specifically in New Iberia and Iberia Parish, how did they respond uh, to uh, emancipation? In what ways were communities formed? How were communities formed? Uh, and also in understanding where were those communities and also where are uh, those communities uh, still? But definitely thinking through those lens of telling uh, the stories of these communities uh, that have already been told time and time again, but definitely compiling them in a collection uh, of some sort of being available, accessible for uh, educational resources, but also for the wider public to learn, share, connect with, and of course, to continue to grow. And that's where I leave our discussion for today about thinking about how to tell these stories uh, beyond the formal gates of the plantation complex uh, of the sites of enslavement, but into thinking about how does emancipation get told, uh, in what ways can emancipation be told as well, but also that the work of emancipation and the telling of emancipation uh, does not end in a set dates or years, rather, especially as the Iberia Emancipation Trail points out, uh, this is just the beginning. And this is the continuous work of updating, of adding, of including, and of thinking through, especially of centering the stories and the lives and experiences of the enslaved community, and also the descendants of the enslaved community as well. And so now. All right, thank you, Travian, so much. I see that we have some wonderful questions in the chat and we will get to uh, questions at the end after everyone is done presenting. Next up, we will have uh, Ms. Bridget Janae Jones, where she's going to be presenting the history of enslavement around the Nashville area and specifically discuss what is the role of historic sites that focus on slavery in their communities today and those communities that are still being impacted by those effects of enslavement. So good morning, Ms. Jones, and yeah. I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so excited to be here this morning. So thank you guys so much for um, allowing us this platform. Um, and I really want to build on something that Trey said about the legacy of emancipation not being solely regarded to the time period that emancipation happened in. I think that legacy is much fuller. Um, so I want to specifically speak on uh, plantation interpretation as social activism, as well as um, issues of, of reparative justice. Reparations is a word that we're very afraid of in today's generation. Um, so I work at the Bellmead Historic Site and Winery, which is located in Nashville, Tennessee. That plantation was historically 5,400 acres, and it ran from 1807 until 1906, roughly 99 years or so. Um, and at the peak of enslavement, 
the Hardy and Jackson family owned 136 enslaved men, women, and children, which placed them in the top 4.5% of slaveholders in the state of Tennessee by 1860. So the Hardy and Jackson family was extremely uh, uh, high up on the class ladder at that time period, especially concerning the slaveocracy. Now, how does this relate to our work today? Well, when you begin to interpret the legacy of enslavement, that in itself is considered social activism, in my opinion. Um, but when you look at social activism, most people tend to think marching and protesting. And yes, that's definitely activism. But historic activism is also a thing. Because until we begin to represent the legacy of especially Southern history correctly in, in Black Americans in Southern history, we'll never be able to understand the reasoning that we have um, that we have the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement built upon the legacy of uh, enslavement and emancipation. Now, as we begin to, sorry about that. As we begin to move into modern era, we begin to see the interpretation of enslavement be something that's looking very trendy these days, which can be very good. But you have to make sure that not only are you interpreting slavery, uh, you have to be interpreting in a way that essentially appeases the descendant community around you. If you are not incorporating the descendant community into your interpretation and you're just interpreting this history in a way that makes you personally comfortable, then you're actually doing a disservice to the um, to the to the field, uh, the field of study in, in, in its entirety. Um, this work is extremely important. Now, what we have done at Bell Mead is make sure that as we develop interpretation and as we have new findings, we allow all of our stakeholders who would be in the descendant community a way, a, a means of entering into our site and saying, hey, this is what I think you should talk about. This is how I think this should be done. This is how I would be comfortable with this being said, because you're speaking about a history that is is, is very personal to many people. Uh, me personally, I believe that these are if these are going to be the individuals that we're going to be speaking about, then they should have final say so in making sure that, that their legacy is being represented accurately. So one of the very interesting people uh, that we discussed at Bell Mead, her name is Susanna Carter, and she was the head of domestic service. So essentially working inside of the house over everyone else that would have been working inside of the house. So as we've developed interpretations surrounding her, we made sure to reach out to her descendants and get any primary source material that they may have, inviting them to take the Journey to Jubilee tour that focuses on enslavement and um, making sure that they feel comfortable and aware about how we're discussing their family and in what context we're discussing their family. Um, and also making sure that we invite the African-American community onto our plantation in local Nashville. So we host all types of events. Uh, one of our biggest events is, of course, our Juneteenth event, where we have lots of activities. We have a Black uh, cultural fair where we bring in vendors from the Black community. We do not charge them a booth fee, and we allow them to just sell whatever product that they have and take home whatever income that they make from that event. And I believe that that's an amazing way to, to try to close the economic gap. Of course, you, you may not get rich from this event, but I think it's a wonderful gesture to show that we stand in solidarity. Um, also on that uh, day, we have local speakers that come and discuss the legacy of enslavement and racism in North Nashville. So having extremely candid conversations about race and racism on this site is definitely very full circle for us at Bell Mead. Now, as it relates to uh, looking at this from a reparation standpoint, Bell Mead has always done an amazing job at putting its money where its mouth is. And that's one thing that I think is very important. Many plantation museums are making tons of money on telling the story of enslavement. However, if these funds are not being allocated to the descendants of the communities that you were discussing, you're still doing a gross disservice. Telling the story is only the first step in this work. So here at Bell Mead, we have recently decided that we are not only going to tell this story, but we're also going to reach out into the community and see how we can give back. We're, uh, we have a $30,000 over three year pledge to the National Museum of African American Music. And that was our first step as they began to open. We wanted to make sure that Bell Mead had a, a stake in saying that we support this institution and the mission of this institution. One of the descendants of Susanna Carter went on to become one of the original Fisk Jubilee Singers. And since the Fisk Jubilee Singers are featured in the Name Ma'am exhibit, it was essential for us to make sure that we had some type of stakehold in their interpretation as well, but also a financial interpretation. 
Now, um, also, we want to make sure that we involve the local HBCUs. If you're in the South, nine times out of 10, there are at least two HBCUs near your plantation museum. And it's imperative that you reach out to those HBCUs and see how their students can be of assistance to your mission. Because I think we also do a disservice to this field when we don't have students of color represented in telling these stories. Uh, so for example, we have recently started a scholarship fund for the students of Tennessee State University. And that scholarship is $10,000 annually. It goes to the history department for incoming freshmen with financial need who want to major in history with a specific focus on African-American history. Now, to a company that we've also established internships and those internship programs go for both Tennessee State University and Fisk University, bringing their students in and giving them outlook and insight into what public history is regarding the interpretation of enslavement. You see, these students are the future of historic interpretation. And there are so few black people represented in this field, especially concerning the interpretation of enslavement. It's imperative that we bring them into this field and show them that not only is this work important, it's profitable. Because if we're being quite honest, nobody is trying to graduate college and come into a low paying job. So looking at raising the rate at Bell Mead of pay, We've also been able to attract more people of color to this job. So this activism is hand in hand with the legacy of emancipation. So many things were promised to black people post emancipation and many of those promises were not made good on. So I think it is, the, it, it is so important that the same spaces that created the inequity that we see are gonna be the same spaces that are going to be rectifying the issues that were caused in America. It is in my personal opinion that plantations are ground zero for American racism. So if any place in any site is looking to, to talk about racism and to heal the wounds that have been caused by racism, it should be plantation museums. But that also goes into ensuring that your board is on board. So that means looking at and choosing your board members wisely. That's part of that activism. And that's something that Bill Mead has made sure to do very, very delicately. Uh, making sure that you have members of the descendant community on your board, making sure that you have members of the African-American community on your board to make sure that you're guiding this ship correctly. Um, and also, of course, making sure that you have people of color in executive leadership. Um, all too often do we see plantation museums have black interpreters, but no black directors. And, and that's imperative. My title at Bell Mead is Director of Equitable Partnerships. And I think that that is amazing because it allows me to really step out into the community and, and use Bell Mead's money to, to assist the black community in ways that are actually beneficial. Instead of just saying, hey, look what we're doing. We're doing good work. Actually going into the community and saying, how can we help? I think that's the most important thing that we can do at this point. So telling the story, like I said, is just the very first step in the ladder but moving forward and building upon that to say, how can we use these funds to be beneficial to these communities is the next step. Um, here in Nashville, of course, housing is a big problem. We're facing gentrification in a lot of historic black neighborhoods. We have many food deserts. So Bell Mead is really working to make sure we can address each of these issues specifically. That means having gardens on site and allowing the produce grown in those gardens to go into the North Nashville community free of charge. Um, that means assisting in any way with, with knowledge on, on adequate housing, bringing in people to discuss credit, bringing in people to discuss buying a house, bringing in people to discuss FAFSA and higher education, and making the Plantation Museum more of a community center than a money-making site. Yes, we're all in it to make money, but this history and this interpretation and this work is so much deeper than just making money and bringing people in to drink mint juleps. Um, essentially, this work is the legacy of Dr. King. It is the legacy of Malcolm X. It is the legacy of Marcus Garvey. This legacy that we're building upon is, 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 is spiritual, it is impactful, and it's something that is not to be taken lightly. And I think it is very imperative that we look at this and say, how can we move forward from enslavement? Because some of those promises, as I stated earlier, are still kind of left to the dust. Those 40 acres and a mule never really came. So how can these sites today assist in making some of these promises come true today? Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Ms. Jones. That was wonderful.
Um, I love that. Thank you to all of our panelists that have uh, presented. We do have a few minutes for questions. And so I'm going to just pull out some questions from the chat um, for us to discuss. So this first one is for Dr. Stevens. Um, one good question were, are there any plans at the University of Alabama to use the surviving quarters as commemoration or as any form of interpretation or anything similar to that? I, I'm finding it hard to say anything after um, Bridget's moment there. It was amazing. Thank you for your inspiring us all, Bridget. And um, the work you're doing at Bellmead is 200 steps ahead of what's happening at the University of Alabama. Um, the Those quarters are not open to the public. They are not discussed they are presented on tours of the university as garden sheds. Um, I tried to take a um, class to see them and I had to go through 17 steps of the president's office to even get onto the grounds. Can't go in them. So, you know, um, talk about ground zero, Bridget, for racism. Um, there's, we, we want them to be interpreted. I would love to make them a, 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 a museum site, a stop on the civil rights trail in Tuscaloosa, like all of the above, but at, at the moment they're, they're close to the public, unfortunately. All right. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Ambrose, there was an interesting question there. Um, how long did the mapping project take to create and how many people worked on it? Yes, so the mapping project uh, from conception to its reveal uh, took around three months uh, during the summer of 2021. Um, it was revealed in regards to in August, um, but I was the only person and I called myself a compiler. I'm not the originator of these stories. I've just simply been listening. Uh, these stories, these are not voices waiting to be heard. These voices have already been heard and they're loud and they're speaking. I'm just the listener and compiler of these stories. Uh, so to say that how many people worked on in research, uh, many people over years, I mean, definitely my work goes out to those at the shadows uh, and those who were brought in in regards to consultation at the shadows uh, to do that wider interpretation story uh, and bring in more research as well. And so without them, I could not compile these stories. I could not compile these locations. And of course, the Iberia African American Historical Society uh, for those stories as well. So I was just the compiler uh, and kind of the organizer of it all, but definitely uh, that research went out to them. All right, thank you. And uh, Bridget, I'm not sure if you can see the chat. You have a lot of invitations to Charleston and <laughs> to many other places to uh, go and make some change. So I definitely see some traveling in your future. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> but, uh, one interesting question that has popped up, what other ways has Bellmead attracted other Black uh, people into leadership and executive positions maybe not just at the site itself, but in the Nashville community? Um, absolutely. So we, in the culmination of Journey to Jubilee, which is our tour that focuses on enslavement, um, we put a call out um, because at the time I was about to vacate my role as director of African-American studies. Um, so when I found out that I was leaving that role, as we're moving past the culmination of Journey to Jubilee and looking at it and saying, how can we continue this? We specifically reached out to the HBCU community and said, hey, Bridget is leaving. If you have a graduating senior who is looking to build a career in this work, please send all applicants <laughs> over. We still have not filled that position because we cannot get anyone to apply for it at the moment. Um, which is another part of the work that we're doing with the internship program and giving younger students insight into what working in a plantation would be, but making it aware that we're hiring for this position and we want someone uh, of African-American descent in this role and being very, very uh, direct about that. Um, and that's one of the biggest things that we've done. All right, thank you. Um, there's one more important question I'm asking if this session will be available for a second review. We're not sure 
um, if the slave, slave dwelling project, it, oh, sorry, go ahead, uh, Dr. Stevens. I thought I saw, and uh, John can correct me if I'm wrong, that the recordings are available on the website for the next event. So um, please go to those. And also, we are all open to speak further with anybody and would love to hear from you. And I think, I don't know what's the way to share our contact information as Sean. Um, so first of all, for the, the video recordings, they will be available on the socio site, I think up to 30 days. Um, sometimes there, it takes a day or two for them to be available, but then they should be on our YouTube site with the slave dwelling project pretty soon. So the, the recordings will be available as far as like contact information. I'm not sure if you guys have, um, that on a slide that I could, uh, display, um, or, we could figure out a way to, to put that on our, our website as well, because I think that the presentations and things will be available for people. So um, but I can definitely make a note of that, that there was a request for consultation for everybody. And um, if we could just get that to Joe, then we could get that up. Yeah, and I'm easy enough to find by Googling students at the University of Alabama, but just with Trey and Bridget in August, would y'all mind sharing your email addresses in case somebody wants to reach out directly because your project is so important and your perspective is just amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I can drop, I'm in the studio stream, but I can drop mine in the private chat if you want to just put it out for the greater public. Yep, I can do the same. Yeah, same as well. Perfect. Perfect. Well, guys, it is uh, 945 and um, just wanted to say thank you so much for your session. Thank you so much for your work. Um, just some great things being done. Um, I had uh, messaged uh, Dr. Stevens, Rachel, about, um, you know, the garden sheds and how this would be a great opportunity for uh, Joseph McGill to do an overnight stay. And so we're going to see what we can do to, to maybe open the door for uh, Joe staying in one of those garden sheds behind the president's mansion, because definitely a lot of work to be done. Uh, but, you know, thankfully the work getting started and, um, you know, taking that next step, just as Bridget said, you know, so we, we've started the conversation, but now we need to move forward. So, but thank you guys. Uh, anything else to, uh, to finish up uh, today from uh, August or any of our uh, panelists today? I just want to say thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, and to our panelists, I just want to say thank you to all for the work that you're continuing to do. Um, I love each of y'all presentations. And I'll step back and let y'all speak or say anything you might want to say to close out. Thank you all for the opportunity for, for doing the work that you do. We're all in this together. All right, great. And thank you guys for sharing your uh, emails. I've got those. And, and so I will turn those over to Jen. And, um, <clears throat> we'll make sure that uh, you guys have access to it. Um, and hopefully that'll be very, very soon. All right. Thank you guys so much. And I hope you guys have a great day and continue the great work. And we will see you in a new session. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.